Hi, everybody. Um, it's a ple pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to share with you today uh, um, an example of one of the resources that we have at the, at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Um, called, it's called the Teaching Case. Um, in this particular one, we're going to use to look at um, ice mass loss um, in Greenland and Antarctica, and it's based on um, NASA's GRACE mission. Um, the teaching cases, we have, we have several of them, and I'll quickly run through the, the examples, so in case you're interested in, and you know you teach in something other than earth science. Um, but basically, th this is a response to lots of sort of secondary data, so data that students haven't collect being available um, on the web. And we, we're, we're sort of looking at the problem of, of having students analyze this data and not really having a context for where that data came from. And so we've kind of refined this model of, it's a four part model, five parts really, um, including the data analysis of, of combining um, readings and videos, and then a data analysis activity to kind of help the kids see the story, um, you know, or, or follow the scientists really through the story and, and kind of look at the questions that they're trying to answer. Um, so in, in the, each of the teaching cases is a little bit different, but in this case, um, you know, we have an introduction that, that sort of sets the stage. Um, after that, we would stop and do an activity, which I'll, I'll explain in a second. Um, and then we're going to do a, a, um, another reading and, and part of the video so that you see how the data is collected. Um, then we, we would do a data analysis activity. And then so the kids can work with the data that the scientists collected and come up with their own conclusions before they move into part three, which is a reading that kind of explains from the scientist's perspective what they found you know, in their analysis of that data. And then the last piece is you know, more broader, broader, uh, broader implications of the data. And so we, we follow this, this model um, and we'll, I'll, I'll take you through, like real, we're gonna dip our toe quickly into the GRACE um, data, but we have one for um, looking at blue whale data. Um, the data here are these are, are tracking tags that um, some scientists from Stanford put on the back of the whale. So you actually get video of the whale diving from looking, you know, kind of towards the tail and towards the head and speed and depth and all kinds of stuff. So it's really kind of a cool, um, cool data that they collect. Um, we have one that uses um, phylogenetic trees to look at the origin of uh, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus bacteria. Um, we have one that uses iris data um, to look at um, earthquake risk in Bangladesh. So there's a lot of social implications there of you know, these incredibly, this incredibly poor country with not a lot of research or, uh, resources getting, um, you know, kind of bracing for an inevitable huge earthquake. Um, we have one that uh, looks at zebra mussel data. So the Cary Institute up in Kingston, New York, about, uh, you know, an hour's drive north of New York City ha has been collecting data on the Hudson River for uh, several years. And they have a, we have a bunch of data before the zebra mussels invaded the river and then after. So it's a cool um, kind of before and after, um, you know, kind of, um, you know, stability and change or cause and effect um, kind of case study. And then the one that we're going to look at today um, looks at um, the GRACE mission and it's uh, how it, it can use, um, you know, pretty ingeniously um, track uh, changes in water on the earth. Um, so really quickly, so what I'm going to show you in, in, you know, the next 40 minutes, we would spend at least a day in a teacher professional development session. Um, and teachers would probably spend, you know, multiple days um, going through this um, with their kids in a class. Um, but the basic goals are, um, you know, from a science learning perspective is to become familiar with the use of satellite data for studying the climate and to look at some of the implications of climate change. Um, and, you know, as a, a teacher, um, you know, I would love for you to kind of dip your toe into this teaching case model and maybe explore some of the others. Um, and then to, to look at a, a really briefly at some strategies for analyzing and interpreting data. Um, and um, sort of where this is going to fit in, you know, in the NGSS. So um, probably the best cross-cutting concept um, for what we're going to be looking at today would be stability and change. Um, science, the science and engineering practices, um, 
probably analyzing and interpreting data and a little bit of math and computational thinking. And then in terms of, uh, of our uh, disciplinary core ideas, this kind of fits in the earth and human activity um, bucket under the climate part of that. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the, the URL for this a little bit later, but the GRACE um, teaching case is kind of all encapsulated on uh, a page that looks something like this. Um, and under this tab right here, um, we would come to our first um, curriculum piece, which is, uh, which is a reading. Um, the readings come in two flavors. Um, this is a, a quick example of um, the, the teacher version, but we also have a middle school sort of lexile level for, for, for seventh, eighth grade. Um, and it's organized a little differently. It's single column, um, you know, it's a little bit shorter. Um, and it's designed so that you can use, if you use literacy strategies in your classroom, um, there's plenty of space for sort of annotating on the sides. And we're not going to, we don't have time for me to have you read this, um, but as you, at the, what, what I would have teachers do and teachers would have their students do as they go through here is kind of look for um, some of the definitions that are presented in here to kind of make sure that they're, they're gathering them. And so this is what's covered. It's a little bit of front loading. Um, but this is what's covered in, in this first essay. Um, and I'll give you a second in, in case um, you're not familiar with any of these terms. Um, the big one here is this idea of ice sheets. So these huge masses of ice, of land ice, um, and the only places we have them on our planet are Greenland and Antarctica. And then the other idea is just like the composition of of, of water on earth and the fact that it's mostly salt water and then of the fresh water, um, most of it's underground, uh, or a lot of it's underground, most of it's ice. Um, and there's just a thin slice of the stuff that we can actually use um, as humans. So any change in that um, you know, could present um, issues. So I would have you read um, this. And then we would spend some time. Um, we usually, I usually pull out a whiteboard and then look at these last two things here. So when we think about what data should scientists collect in order to investigate Greenland and, Ar and, Ar and the Antarctic ice sheets, and then what methods do you think they should use? And so we usually, I usually make a T chart, um, you know, one side for the data and one side for the method. We just do a brainstorm um, for, you know, a few minutes. Um, and, you know, they come up with lots of ways. Sometimes, even though they know, that it's about grace, um, they don't mention satellites. Um, sometimes they do. Um, and then that would lead us into um, part two, um, which introduces the grace satellites and how things work. Um, and um, there's, a, there's a reading there, which of course we're not gonna have time for, um, but there is also um, a part of a video that I'm gonna share with you um, to kind of introduce the grace mission um, to us all. And it's right here. So this is part of a longer video. I'm just going to play the first three minutes of it. Of the universe. Gravity is one of the fundamental forces of the universe. And it's connected with mass. Anything that has mass has Dave, we're not seeing your yes. screen right it's now. Oh, we tend sorry, to sorry. the weight of the Earth is Is that better? Yes, looks like it's going to be. Okay, let me start this over again. Gravity is one of the fundamental forces of the universe. And it's connected with mass. Anything that has mass has gravity. We tend to think of the weight of the Earth as being entirely rocks and magma deep in the Earth. But actually, on the surface of the Earth, as you look around, you see the atmosphere and you see the ocean and you see snow fields and polar ice caps. All of those things have mass too, but those things change much more frequently. So what we realized is if we could design a mission that was accurate enough to observe those small changes, we could actually watch the polar ice caps melt. We could measure polar ice mass loss. We could even measure how much water is in the ground after it rains. And that led us to come up with the GRACE mission.
deep in the earth or even on the surface of the earth, that, that the way mass is distributed with mountains and trenches and all kinds of things is slightly different, slightly non-uniform. So as you were to walk around the earth, you'd actually sense more or less gravity. You'd actually weigh a little bit more, a little bit less on different parts of the earth. Isaac Newton taught us that the amount of mass that I'm standing on top of affects the gravity where I'm standing. So the rate at which this apple comes down is a function of how much mass is below me on the earth. So no matter where you are, what's below you will be different. So gravity will be different, and so the apple will drop at a different rate. The orbit of a satellite is highly dependent upon the gravity field of the planet that it's orbiting. So what we wanted to do was put up a satellite whose orbit we could measure incredibly accurately. The best way to do that was to observe one satellite with another satellite. So the satellites are sort of chasing each other, pole to pole, flying around the Earth. And as the first one comes up, for example, on a mountain, it feels that mountain first. So it starts to get pulled toward the mountain. But the second one isn't quite there yet, so the satellites tend to sort of drift apart. Then, of course, as they're leaving the mountain, the second one is still feeling the effect of the mountain. So they come together again. And that sort of dance that the two satellites do as they go around the Earth is what tells us what the gravity field underneath them was. Now, in addition to that, the gravity field is also changing every day, every week, every month, because water is moving all around the Earth and it's raining here or the polar ice cap is melting. So water is the primary thing that's changing. But what scientists really want to understand is not just what happens across one year. They want to really see that play out over, over many years, over decades, to try to understand what's really happening in the climate system. So I, I always ask the trick question here to the teachers, like um, of, of what the data that the satellites are collecting is. Um, Cause we kind of get into this data and inference thing. Um, and a lot of them say, you know, it's the gravity field, it's the amount of ice. And, you know, technically it's just the distance between those two satellites. And then they use that to make the inference about um, the changing, you know, water down below it. Um, and it's pretty incredible. So these satellites, um, they they started collecting data in late 2002, um, and they lasted until I think they they finally fell out of orbit and were shut down shut down and then fell out of orbit um, in 2017 and they actually were able to launch um, a follow on mission. So there's a little break. Um, if you look at the, at at our website, the data I'm going to show you, there's no break in the data. But if you go to NASA's data, and I'll show you how to get there as well. Um, there's a little bit of break in the data between the two satellite missions, um, but it's pretty ingenious. And so when you, you think about it, those two satellites, um, the first mission anyway, they were about, a, they would fly about 130 kilometers apart. And that change that he's talking about was, is, is millimeters. So it's not like big, big changes. It's just like, you know, kind of millimeter level changes um, that they're able to, you know, do fancy math and figure out you know, the gravity field down below and then as they go. So they, they do a one orbit every 90 minutes and it takes them about a month to make a complete gravity map of the earth. And so the thing that changes on a month to month basis um, is on, on the surface of the planet is gonna be um, water. So water is pretty heavy, it has gravity. So it actually affects the way these satellites um, orbit. And so they're able to make a map um, that I'd like you to look at. Um, Dave, I'm going to interrupt you just for a second. Yep. We have a question in the chat box that I want to make sure yep. that we touch on before we go further so we don't have any concerns. Um, there's one question about deciding on the speed of the satellite. Is that controlled by someone from the ground or is that happening because of the gravity field? Ooh, you'd have to talk to a NASA JPL person for that one. Um, I, I think a 90 minute orbit is, is a fairly standard orbit for the for where these guys are. It's, it probably relates to, to maintaining um, a, a pretty a, a consistent um, altitude. Um, but that's that one's out a little bit out of my uh, my reach. Um, but, it, but but it's the characteristics of the orbit. 
So I, I don't I don't know. Um, I'm sure it's determined by the physics of of keeping them in orbit like that. That was totally unsatisfactory, I know, but no, actually it's very good. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna send, let me show you what I'm gonna send you first. Um, so on, on this, so the, the resources are here. So I'll give you the link to this page in a bit. Um, but um, in the second tab would take you um, here. And this is, I'm gonna actually, um, we're gonna go into groups in a second. Um, and I want you to spend a little bit of time um, kind of playing with this interactive um, and kind of just talking about the patterns that you see. So what are the patterns that you see um, that, that you recognize um, over the course and this that unfortunately this is not um, it goes from 2003 to 2009 and, and it's not marked off um, according to gear unfortunately um, but I think you can probably tell by looking at patterns that you might see in the in the tropics um, kind of when the seasons are changing um, so the, what, what this presents is this idea of a, a water storage anomaly and um, basic and so this is a tough a tough concept for kids sometimes but basically if it's red it's drier than the average for that area okay and if it's blue it's wetter than the average for that area and the average is from this over this whole data set so if we were if we were to add more data to this visualization the you know the zero line would change so it's basically um it shows you the change and it's specific to each area so it's not over the whole whole planet um, so kind of look for look for trends that you might see and then if you have time you can kind of pop down here and we're going to be um, looking at greenland and antarctica so you might want to pop in and we can zoom in um, and and get some information on antarctica and then so you just push the button and it'll kind of um, proceed through the data um, and so you get the color changes over here and you get a graph um, of um, water storage here. Um, and then you can get the same thing for Greenland. And we also have the Central Valley of California, Austria, India, um, the Lena Basin of Russia. And we're not, we're not going to address those today. Um, and the, and the, the, I, I have, if you're really interested in those, um, email me because we have some, some of the great scientists sort of supplied us with some, some of the ways to look at that data. But it's actually pretty complicated. Um, and um, Greenland and Antarctica, we're just looking at ice storage, changes in ice storage. And with these guys, if you want to look at groundwater and everything, you're dealing with evapotranspiration and all kinds of stuff like that. So the equations are more complicated, but you can do the analysis if, if uh, you're up for it and your kids are up for it. Um, so we're going to send you into groups of like four or five. So introduce yourselves really quickly. Um, you may want to have one person in your group share the screen. Um, and then um, kind of look through this. I'm gonna place um, this URL in the chat. So you wanna grab that um, before you go into the chat. So I don't think that the chat follows you into the group necessarily. Um, and, and basically you're just looking for, um, you're looking for trends, patterns, noticings. Um, right, so there's the, there's the data interactive. So you might want to grab that. And let's say, let's do, let's go till 4.30. So I'll give you about eight minutes um, to do this. And so um, Mitchell will invite you into a group. And as soon as you grab that URL, um, go in. So you're looking for patterns. So what are the patterns that you see um, in that water storage anomaly um, visualization? I'm seeing the question now. Henri, is that you? How do you decide to reduce the speed of the satellite? Um, I, I I think they just fall out of orbit. I think they just fall. I mean, I mean you know, an orbit is a is a is a fall anyway. And I no, think the idea was when you show the, the 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 images, the two satellites at the moment one was uh, getting a. Uh, 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 a faster speed and the other one weight. So how, how could you uh, in the space control the speed when the one was over the, the land and the other one just weight? 
So, so the, the, the you, you don't control the speed, but that's actually the data that they collect. So if let, let's say one satellite is getting close to the Himalayas, right? So that gravity would pull that satellite, would affect that first satellite before it affected the other one. So that pulls them apart slightly. And so that's that's what they record as the data, and then they use that the changes in that. So then you know as it as it goes across, and then the other satellite approaches the Himalayas and would be more affected by that. Mm. So depending on the mass of the Earth and the water and the ice oh. below the satellites, that causes them to kind of slightly the distance between them changes oh. ever so slightly. Okay, and that's where they get the the calculations for the the, gra the mass below the gravity below i did not catch that first yeah. <laughs> it's pretty cool it's pretty ingenious <laughs> yeah thank you so anybody want to share really quickly anything that they noticed looking at the at the water i have another question sure. when you show the map you s we see that the south the the north part the northern part of the America of South America is drier than the desert in Africa. That surprised me. Well, be careful because the the color is specific to the location on the map, right? So, so the it's it's the it's whether it's drier or wetter than than usual for that location. Okay. So, um, let me share my screen again. So I was in the group with Henri and we were talking about this. And um, one comment I would make is where it says below that it the anomaly is the difference from the average, maybe put a note in there that it's the average for that specific location, um, yeah. not you know global average. And, yeah. and because it is not drier, right? It just has a larger variability. Right, right. So right here, like, yeah, um, let me share my screen. Um, So you see like, you know, this rainforest area is showing it as red. It just means that's the drier than average in for that area during the course of the data. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's, I mean, the anomaly is, is really tricky for kids. Um, but, but yeah, we, we make sure we, we clarify that really, I, I, I tried to clarify it for you guys. Um, and when I'm working with teachers and students, um, we actually spend some time on that to make sure that that they're interpreting that correctly. Um, any other questions really quick before we move on? We're kind of, we're running out of time fast, but. Is the centimeters equivalent? Oh, go ahead. Okay, I, I was in group four and um, we were just wondering, for instance, like Greenland, we were kind of watching Greenland for a little bit and we were wondering if during the times when it is showing it being drier than average, is that total moisture? So including both ice and liquid water, or is it just looking at liquid water? No, it's gonna pick up the total, the total, it, it actually picks up the change in gravity. Okay. Okay. And so, and so that's interpreted. The only thing that's really changing on a scale from month to month on the earth um, is water storage. So in Greenland, it, it, it's going to be ice. Okay. All right. So what did you guys notice, um, you know, in the, in the Greenland? It got darker over time. Like it, the, the, the drier than average seemed to be increasing over time. Right. So, so rather than some places like, like the rainforests where you see where you had a seasonal flip-flop, right? So it got, it went yeah. blue and then it went red and then it went blue and went red. Greenland sort of started out blue and then it progressively got red. So yeah. what does that mean? And so what we're going to do is, is we're going to, I'm going to show you another way to look at the data um, that's going to allow you to, to zero in on that a little bit. We're not going to unfortunately have a lot of time um, for this, but hopefully, you know, I, I've spent hours like looking at this. I think it's fascinating, and so um, I kind of, you know, tend to do that. Um, so um, if we just wanted to look at Greenland and Antarctica, um, here's here's what the data looks like. Um, you know, that Grace comes up with. Um, so it comes up with these, uh, it, it has a funny calendar. So it's in decimals. So 2002.3. So I guess that would be, you know, a third of the way through the year. Um, and then it gives it, and then here's, and it gives it in gigatons. Um, but this is, it, it's a change, you know, so, so you get kind of this change in, in, in ice mass. 
And just to contextualize, here's a, here's a, sort of an example of a gigaton, and I'm from New York City, and so we like the Empire State Building. And so basically, you know, that's one gigaton of ice. Um, and so what I'm going to do, I'm going to pop another URL for you, and that's going to give you access to this graphing tool. Um, and I'll introduce that to you really quickly here. Um, so when you go in, you have a few controls. So you'll, you'll come to a, something that looks like this. Um, you can turn off Antarctica if you want. You can turn off Greenland if you want. Um, and you can also zero in on different um, dates by moving these sliders down here. Um, or just kind of like pick a four year cycle and kind of move through. Um, and down here, and so this is important. This is actually, you can, you can get graphs that are similar to this on the NASA site. Um, but um, what we've added to that down here is depending on what's depicted in this blue bar up here, um, you actually get the, the linear regression. And so if you remember your y equals mx plus b, so this number right here is going to be your slope. So that's going to be your rate of change. Um, and so that's kind of what, what you might want to focus on um, over the course of, uh, of, of the, the whole data set. Um, so, you, so look at Greenland, look at Antarctica. Um, as you click each one, you know the graph below shows up with the with the the equation for the line. Um, and so, what I'd like you to do, um, and I'll give you about seven minutes to do this. Um, and and don't it, it, if you're having trouble sharing your screen, just do it on your own and kind of maybe have a conversation with people because I think it's important for you to kind of okay. And so, my instructions for you, I mean, this would be like a you know, a 45 minute activity if we were sitting in a professional learning room. So don't don't worry. But um, basically um, your, your job is to make some graphs. So produce some graphs and just use the tool and they're made for you. Look at the trends, look at the magnitude of the trends and then think about um, the observations that you can make based on this. And um, and also kind of what, are, what other questions can we look at sort of with this tool based on this information. Um, so um, I will put the URL for this in the chat. So you might want to grab that before you go into your groups. And so Let's, uh, let's, unfortunately, this is going to be rather quick. So we'll do six minutes until 445 Eastern, and then we'll come back and we can have 10 minutes to kind of wrap up and um, talk about other, you know, questions and, and other issues. Um, okay. Um, so give you six minutes. Um, David, I have a question that just came up in our group. So sure. we were looking at as much time range as we could and then comparing Greenland and Antarctica. And we noticed that the rate of change, the ice mass loss is faster in Greenland consistently. Um, can you say a few words about why that is? And there's a couple of things. One, it, it, it's a little hard sometimes to compare Greenland and Antarctica because Antarctica is way bigger. Um, and, and actually there's, you know, there's places in Antarctica, you know, depending on which side of like that Antarctic mountain range you're on, um, you might you know, actually, there's, because there's more moisture in the atmosphere right now, there's actually some places that are gaining snow, um, snow mass. So it's, it's kind of tricky. Um, and Antarctica is actually, you know, a little bit, it, um, it's not as, as quite, it, it's a little farther away from the pole. So it probably has like, you know, the, the warming is going to be more extreme there. Greenland um, is, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, besides, so so that, that was going to be my question. It's like, what did you all notice? Um, that, that was one of them. The Greenland seems to be losing ice faster than Antarctica is. Anything else? I mean, they're both losing ice, so. One of the things that came up in our breakout room was, um, comparing those uh, windows of time. And as you look from a two year to a four year to a all the data perspective, it really changes the storyline. It changes the slope of that line and, and how dramatic the 
the um, changes in water or storage are. So it just emphasizes the need for these long-term data sets. Right, and that's really important because you know even even in this area, you know every year is not the same, and so there there's an overall trend, but then there's weather. Um, and so one of the things so that we usually do, and I'm going to kind of cut to the chase here really quickly because we're we're running out of time, is is we ask the question is is the ice mass loss accelerating in either of these places? Um, and so sort of there's a couple of really there's a crude way to do this um, that I'll share with you um, that we've kind of done that actually some teachers devised. Um, and they just like broke it up into chunks. So this is Greenland, right? So they decided, you know, we're gonna look at like these three year chunks and from the beginning of the data set and afterwards. And if you look at Greenland, you're like, oh man, it's, you know, at least, you know, using this crude analysis, it looks like the ice mass loss is accelerating. When you do the same analysis um, with for Antarctica, it's not quite as clear. Um, but this was actually a question that, um, during the early days of GRACE. Um, so this paper came out, this is a, a paper by a, a scientist um, named Isabella Villaconia. And um, this paper came out, I think in 2009, yeah, 2009. And she basically um, graphed the data and decided that it wasn't linear. It was, it, the, you know, the best fit line is actually quadratic um, sloping downward. And so to her, that was an indication that um, the ice mass loss is accelerating even over that, you know, seven year um, time period. And if you want to look at that, if you, if your kids have the ability, if you go into this, uh, you know, and, and click on the hamburger here. So this is the back to the graph where you guys were at. Um, you can click on this little hamburger and you can download um, the data and stick it in a spreadsheet if you're, if you or your kids or both um, have the ability to do that kind of analysis. Um, so it, it's there for you. Um, the place where this data came from, so this is the, the NASA website um, where this came from, and you notice there's a break here. So theirs is more up to date. We have to um, get on get on this one and, and uh, add the latest data. Um, but you can tell that the trend basically is continuing. Um, and if you, yeah, you have to register, but you can download this data as well from NASA um, if you wanted to do it that way. So there's Antarctica and there's Greenland. Um, but, you know, the story is kind of continuing. Um, with the GRACE follow-on mission. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Grab my email. Um, if, and, and we got a couple minutes we can um, spend on questions. There were a couple of questions that popped into the chat box. One of them you've already answered, and that was about how to get the actual data. Um, there was a question earlier from uh, Michelle who teaches K-5 and she was wondering if the NGSS details are student facing anywhere. She likes to share all of those details with her students. Well, and to clarify, I teach future K-5 teachers. Oh, thank you. Thanks for clarifying that. I misread yep. yours. All right, so the question is, are, are those NGSS details student facing? What, um, what, what are the, the you mean the, like you were mentioning the cross-cutting concept and um, the science and engineering practices. I try to help my students think about science standards as 3D and walk them through those connections because that's usually new to them and they're going to teach later. <laughs> right. Um, so I'm, I, I'm just, I don't quite understand your question because I think, I think, you know, we have to make it student facing, right? Um, there's no, there, there isn't a, there isn't a performance expectation that kind of just, you know, incorporates all three. So, so I would, I would, um, you know, do something like, um, you know, analyze and interpret data to show the effect of human activity on ice mass loss or the, the change of, of, of um, ice mass loss based on human activity to sort of incorporate, you know, those three dimensions that I mentioned. So, so the DCI, like I said, is in the ESS3, um, really 3D, um, that earth and human activity. Um, and then it could, you know, for, for younger kids, you know, it might be just, you, they might want to focus on patterns instead of like this idea of, of stability and change, but it may just be recognizing the patterns in the data that they see. Um, 
and you might not want to go to the graphs with those teachers and maybe just use, although, you know, anomalies are, is, is a tough concept for little kids. Um, yeah. But maybe just the changing colors of that first graph would be kind of where you want to, would, would want to focus there. Um, All right, thanks. That's challenging. Oh, yeah, I'm not thinking about having it be student facing for the K-5 students. It's okay. more for my students that I'm teaching so that they wrap their heads around it. But I think oh. those are how I could structure an activity yeah. for sure. Any other Paula, questions? A Paula did you want to unmute and ask your question? Sure. Um, so I, I, I was wondering whether there were also any images of the changes in either Greenland and or um, physically that one could put or, or Antarctica that one could put in image J because I use that for with ozone images and then have them create the graphs from that. So here one could grab the data and give the students and have them make the graphs and see what it told them. But I wondered if there was also the the piece that allows them to see the uh, the shrinkage in any way in the uh, ice masses. I've, I've never tried to do that, but I wonder, and I don't know this for sure, I wonder if there's a, there's NASA satellites that take, uh, you know, or NOAA satellites that take pictures of, of Greenland in particular, um, that you can string together and do that. So that's, that's an interesting question. All right, can look for them, that's all. <laughs> yeah, and, and I wonder what you would notice though, because it, it's not like, like the ice mass is shrinking visibly this way. It's mostly, you know, kind of shrinking from the top down. So well, of course, that makes sense. Um, the, the usefulness of it is that you can animate them and they can see how they can see the small changes, which can be measured. That's how it works with the ozone um, images. So I was just thinking this would be an interesting um, assignment that would be similar, but with different material. <laughs> That'd be cool. If you figure it out, please share it. Uh, absolutely. The uh, the image J assignment is a um, is a circ um, exercise some hidden somewhere, buried somewhere. That's where I got it from. <laughs> Excellent. So I think I have to stop right there. So I'll turn it back over to Ida and uh, and thank you very much. And make sure you guys. So so I'm I'm D Randall at AM and H, American Museum of Natural History dot org. Um, so if you have any questions, um, you know, shoot, shoot me an email. I'm happy to, to help you out as much as I can. Okay, I'm actually, I'm gonna- Put my email in the chat right now too, since the slide's down, so. I'm going to share my screen real quickly here. Thank you so much, David. You're quite welcome. Data too. Okay, um, are you guys seeing my screen now? Yes. Okay, I want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to fill out our post webinar survey. This is very important information for us. So please do jump on for this link. Um, Mitchell, if you could drop that link into the chat box, that would be wonderful. I appreciate that a lot. Thank you. And then uh, just to give you a quick reminder, the three organizations that sponsor this webinar series, NAGT, National Association of Geoscience Teachers, which does have a full set of webinars, not just ours, but others and the link is in the center of this page. And I'm sure Mitchell's going to drop that into the chat box as well. So please do check out the NAGT webinar series and we'd love to have you come join us. We are a really fun group in the NAGT community with lots of great resources and benefits for our members. And then also the National Association of Earth Science Teachers invite you to visit NESTA at, I think that should be nestanet, N-E-S-T-A-N-E-T dot org. And the third uh, sponsor of the webinar series in the working group is the American Geosciences Institute. And I invite you to visit their pages for lots of resources and especially Earth Science Week materials. So thank you very much for joining us today, February 11th. Again, there will be a webinar entitled Soil Biology, Chemistry, Physics, Oh My. That registration will open up and information will be coming to your inboxes soon. And visit the AGI YouTube channel for our complete playlist. And if you'd like to get in touch with any of the three of us, please reach out to us at one of our email addresses. So thanks very much to everybody for joining us today. Thank you, Dave Randall, for a wonderful presentation and engaging us so well in the breakout groups. That was really fun. So thanks very much. And I hope everyone has a great rest of your afternoon.
Yeah, you're welcome. So, so everybody, make sure you check out the readings. So go in and uh, and check out the readings. And there's actually more of that video that I showed you too. If you want to look at some groundwater issues, so. Thanks, everybody.